Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning we are joined by Sister Nusrat, Sister Nazia and Sister Sayyida to continue our discussion on female sahabiyat. So mashallah, just before we went on the break, uh, Sister Sayyida, you were discussing about the uh, societal and home obligations um, that uh, the sahabiyat had in their time and you were talking about Khadija radiallahu anha. I don't know if you wanted to add something more before I cut you off. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. I think what happens sometimes is, is that, that we just get caught up in our situation today and I think that mashallah you know every single hadith that exists every single ayah from the Quran is there for a reason and what we should do is rather than getting caught up with little technicalities we should really understand how can we take the lessons from them and apply it to our lives and so for example looking at Khadija you know she was a prime example of balance in every aspect of her life and and also what's amazing to me is that she was the one that the Prophet Muhammad would go to when he needed advice you know what is that still happening today do our husbands come to us and are we ready to give the advice and to ask questions and help that to guide our husbands um, in the way that they need or are we just so caught up in the things that we're doing and and I think that for me the biggest kind of um, lesson that we can take from the female Sahabia is, is is how they had that balance in their life you know, it's not about being excellent in one area and slacking in another. It's actually about increasing your ihsan and excellence in all areas of your life. SubhanAllah, I think it goes back to as well the kind of relationship that you have and how you view things. I mean, if we look at societal and home obligations, did the female sahabiyat see any difference between the two and what kind of difference is there now in, in the world that we live in? I think that the issue... It, they understood that their purpose in life was to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. So that meant they had responsibilities in all aspects of life, whether it was in private life or whether it was in public life. They actually understood the responsibility. So when you look at what they were doing, it wasn't like a conscious, like, this is, this is home, this is... It wasn't like that. They weren't categories, but rather their viewpoint was, uh, this is my function. I've been created to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how, how am I going to fulfill that? Yeah. And so that was how they approached each duty. So when you look to their lives of the Sahabiyat, it wasn't that we never hear them as being just mothers and mm, wives. Yeah. They, it was broader than that. It was much broader than that. You would see examples where women, um, they fill, fulfill their responsibilities. They did not neglect those responsibilities with respect to their families and their husbands. But what they also then did was the other injunctions that they had upon them to go out and seek knowledge for example so they were very much active in that and they were active in terms of what was happening within their society because the example being that um, in Surah uh, Toba, um, you know, men, you know, if you look at it, men, both men and women were allowed and they should, were encouraged to participate in public affairs. So in Surah Toba, it said the believing men and women are protectors of one another. So I, you know, to me, the beautiful example is that of um, of uh, Ashifa bin Abdullah. Now, I know she's often cited as someone who the, the Khalif Umar bin al Khattab he put her in the position of administrative responsibility in the marketplace. I think most people know her for that. But yeah. actually, there was so much more to this woman. You know, if you look at her name, that title in itself derived from the fact it came from healing. Why? Because she was a medicine woman. This was a woman who had knowledge of medicine at a time in when the majority of people were illiterate she was literate in that period and what was said of her was that she used to um, look for pre uh, preventative medicine for uh, ant bites and what happened was um, she was one of the early Muslims and when they heard uh, after the Hijra she approached the Prophet ﷺ, she told him that look this is what I do I I study for preventative measures for this thing and he said show it to me and he she showed it to him and then he then turned around and said to her teach this to Hafsa his wife mm. and apparently she also taught Hafsa to read as well and so to me when I look at the examples of these women and the amazing lives and this is uh, she also had children as well so again it's like why are we bracketing women in, in a way that we shouldn't be bracketing women um, they clearly were active participants in in their society and I think a lot of it was actually down to that society made it possible for them to be that way and I think that's the biggest issue here today not only are we dealing with cultural attitudes that are preventing women coming forward but there's also the practical issues where the reality of the system we're in doesn't make it very easy for women to work and be able to fulfill those responsibilities at home so it's 
it's a very difficult situation to be in, a very difficult situation. And I think a lot of it comes down to if we had a scenario where the Quran and the Sunnah was interpreted in the correct way, we would have a very different society. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you made a good point there about the way the society was set up in that time during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu but. We live in very different times now, and the way that society is made up is very, very different to the way it was then. I mean, how does this then affect us? What kind of difference does that make for us, uh, Sister Nusrat? Well, when we look at the setup um, of the prophet, uh, society in the Prophet's time, it, yes, it was very different. And the reason as to why this was different is because the social system was governed according to Islamic principles. So the divine law, the law of Allah, formed the basis for which society was founded upon. And obviously, by default, this is going to influence the morals and, and course of dealings and guidelines for which people upheld their duties both in the private life and in the public life and yes contrary to orientalist narratives about women's participation in society women could better uphold these duties as the guidelines put in place during the Prophet's time were in a way that does not oppress the Muslim woman but rather preserves her honor and her dignity and even myself as a convert to Islam I find that through when we go back to the teachings of Islam through Quran and Sunnah and Hadith and even through looking at the, the actions of the way the Sahaba were, I, I, like Sister Sayyidah said and Sister Nazia said, there is liberation in that. But how not being in a society, in such society, can affect us is that we have the promotion of societal value. We live in a society where it's not Islamic. And we have some societal uh, values that are pushed towards us and that may be at odds with what Islamically we know as to be cor correct ways of acting and, and our principles and being, which means that some women will, uh, will consider whether they should still uphold these duties in an Islamic, in an Islamic way mm -hmm. or whether they should discard them at all. Similarly, we have the internal conflict as to, you know, does Islam provide us freedom or, or, or does um, secular liberal society do that? So we have this internal battle. So we should remember that the, t the laws of Allah do not change with the time, rather that's static and that's something that we should generally remember. And while in our society we may have the impact, um, we may have this impact of not being in that setting, that doesn't remove our responsibilities. We still maintain our Islamic duties and we look at the, the, um, the Sahabiyats, people like Sumer like um, bin Kayat, for example, who even though they were under a lot of persecution, they still maintain their Islamic identity. So it does, yes, the society does affect us, but it only affects us to a certain extent where um, where yes, it makes it harder. It makes it harder for us to fulfil these um, roles. How how is it difficult in our day to day living? I mean, what are the sort of practical examples that, that we can take from this? Because sometimes it's very easy to mm. discuss things in a sort of theoretical sense. But well, look at it this way: there's pressures in the society for women to go out and work. Mm. Okay, um, I have a brilliant quote from you know Karen Brady um, from uh, The Apprentice. Mm. And basically speaking in a women in the work uh, summit, she, what she actually stated was that look, most of us won't leave our children unless we go into a job that respects us, pays us well, gives us the opportunity we want. And if you put a barrier of quality child childcare, then this is even more difficult. So she summed up in that one thing, all the issues that affect women and the fact that we've got a workforce that doesn't take into account the reality of a woman's situation. To have such rigidity in the workplace where you cannot have um, the ability to deal with your family life. And then coupled with the fact that, like uh, Sister Zayda mentioned, that there are prejudices still there. There's still inequality there in the workplace. What would induce any woman, same woman, to then go out and put herself in this situation? But this is the reality. You know, I've been in a situation where I know I've gone into job interviews and people had had one look at my hijab and that's it. They've made a lot of uh, assumptions based upon that. But this is the, the, the practicalities of uh, what some women face, you know, the kind of uh, things that they're dealing with. And you've also got this whole issue of the, the culture. This, what I've just given you is the Western model of what a woman what is expected of a woman to be doing everything inside and outside of the home then you have on the other side of the spectrum you've got the woman who's conforming to the cultural values where actually she's now prevented from education her her virtual existence is confined within the home place that this is what you do you just take care of the children and it's bizarre because when I think about it you know we always say this the woman is the one who educates the next generation 
how do you then put how that into how do you educate a child, you educate you a educate child? if you don't know fic mm. of if you don't know the fic of salah if you do not understand your akida if you do not understand all of these aspects what are you going to teach your child and even just the whole aspects that there are you know as as human beings we're not born with knowledge we have to acquire it yeah so again it's like it just doesn't make sense mm. how you reconcile these kind of things yet Yet we have a society that clearly that's what the impression is, that somehow women are kind of bracketed into certain situations and they don't you take have, nature Yeah, you tend account. to have this either or sort of outlook on women. Yeah. It's either you're that superwoman who <laughs> works and looks after her children, who makes amazing cakes and then everything is just hunky-dory, sort of like a, a Stepford wife scenario with the career attached. And then you have the other scenario where you're just completely out of touch with society, you're locked away at home, mm. you don't really know much about anything, you don't have much of a relationship with the world mm. around you and it's quite sad but quite often there is this stigma attached to stay-at-home mums especially in a Western society because it's not really seen as being a, you know a contribution to society how do we deal with that sort of in an Islamic context whether we live in the West or not sister Saida I think I think it depends on what you do and, and certainly for me any woman that asks me for advice on whether they should go back to work or whether they should start their own business when their children are babies my answer is always Always no because actually you have to think about what is the right priority for you and so yes I went back to work when my kids were young would I do it again in that situation I probably would but if I was to have an, another kid now then I wouldn't go back to work because actually that time with your young children is very very precious and that is the time when you are planting the seeds for what they're going to be like when they're older now once they're at school I think it's very different and it's about what do you do with that time if you're just if you're sitting at home doing nothing then you know are you actually going to be able to justify your life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on judgment day mm. but if you decide to do something if you're educating yourself if you are contributing to the home in various different ways and that can be through work or through housework or whatever you know there's, there's important things that you can do but I think what's really interesting for me in this whole discussion is that we are responding to a kind of old Western model where actually the West doesn't even understand how to bring women into the workplace because mm. this is quite a new thing and it mm. happened within the world wars and it was because the men then went out to to fight and there was no one to work and when that happened the women gained independence but then when the men came back they were still doing two jobs mm. and it's how do we then find the yeah. right kind of fit do you see what I mean? Yeah, it's about finding, you know, where everything fits in, finding that balance within everything, because I think we're ex we have such high expectations of, of women, of one another and of ourselves, that we kind of lose touch with the reality and pr our priorities as well. I'm really sorry, sisters, I'm going to have to stop you there. Jazakallah oh. <laughs> khair for all of that. We often mix old cultural traditions with Islam, and that is where the confusion and problems arise. But we should remember that whether it be correcting Umar radiallahu anhu or protecting the Prophet وسلم, in battle, the Sahabiyat actively participated in society, equally engaged as the men in furthering the call of Islam. In aiding the Ummah and furthering uh, Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made no distinction between men and women. As the ayah states, the believing men and believing women are allies of one another. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and establish prayer and give zakah and obey Allah and his messenger. Those Allah will have mercy upon them. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. We're off to another break now, but do stay tuned as we'll be back with our last segment where we've asked sisters about the strangest place they've prayed in, in what she thinks. Stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum.